I suppose it's better to be before lunch than right after lunch. While you're hungry, you can still, you're still very alert. Anyway, what a wonderful morning it's been to be here and listen to what's gone on so far. So there's so much I could talk about, but today I do want to try to give you a bit of the personal perspective for going to space, a bit on the shuttle, some on the space station, and maybe more, it's more in that vein rather than talking about, you know, whether it's these specific things that are done up there, I want to focus a little more today on, you know, what is it, what is it really like, if I can somehow communicate that. And I have to pay a bit of a tribute to the space shuttle, you know, we just ended that up last year after a 30-year run, longer than we had any, you know, other program uh, as a part of NASA in terms of human space flight. Um, it was a wonderful vehicle. I have to say, of course, we had five of them. We lost two tragically with the crew, Challenger and Columbia, um, and we'll forever remember them. But I will still have to say it was a tremendous vehicle that did many different things. I don't think we'll ever build anything like it again. It was also somewhat difficult to fly, um, but yet it did so much. In the first part of its life, which you may have forgot a bit about, it. Um, we did all kinds of science inside it. We could carry science laboratories in the cargo bay, basically expanding the, habit the habitable part of the station for the crew to work in. We launched satellites. We would go up and retrieve satellites and repair them, let them go again. We did a lot of those activities with robotics and spacewalks, which we call EVA, extravehicular activities. We made the real world longer than just saying spacewalks. We, do that we did that often at NASA with words. But. Um, it was a great observation platform. It could point very exactly, study the sun, the stars, back at our own planet. Um, and then for the last part, primarily space station construction, which is really why it had the name shuttle in the first place. It was meant to go back and forth from the Earth to another destination, like a space station. It was significant cargo to orbit, as well as bringing it back, which is kind of a loss that we have right now. And throughout its life, we became more and more international, which I think was a tremendous positive result of the program with more international partners and more things going on in regards to humans in space. So it, it was a, a tremendous gift to be able to work with people from around the world. And it had a crew size of four to seven. We've never had anything else that could take that many at one time. We don't have anything quite right now that can. Um, so in terms of opportunities to go for people that were astronauts, it was a tremendous time to be a part of NASA and, and to be doing this. And I flew, by the way, on two of the vehicles that were up there in that slide, twice on Atlantis and twice on Endeavour. A launch, you know, let me see if I can walk you through a launch day. I mean, we get up, the crew's been in quarantine for a week. Uh, at this point, we've been in, in, at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida for maybe three days or four days. We're awakened, there is no chance to oversleep. I'm not a morning person, but you know, they knock on the door. There's no chance to miss the flight uh, in this case. But we get up and usually this was a morning launch. This is actually a picture of my first launch. We haven't always launched in the morning, but this was in the morning of the crew day as well, which could be shifted a bit. So we're awakened, we have breakfast. Um, there's some video going on part of the time. We get to order whatever we want for that meal. And there's weather briefings, and we get suited up, and they're making sure that can the suit be pressurized, does it go to work? We ride out to the launch pad um, in a van, and we approach this vehicle, you know, on the pad that's fully fueled. It has cryogenics uh, in the large tank, so we have some venting of the liquid hydrogen and oxygen, and you can kind of hear the creaking. I mean, it seems like this vehicle has a life to it, you know, on this launch day. So we strap in. Uh, this all takes some time. There's some really dedicated workers there, the, the, the technical crew, the, the suit people. Uh, they strap us in, and then they all leave and go about two or three miles away. And we're left <laughs> waiting, you know, a little bit longer for launch. Um, but listening to the dialogue between the launch center in, in, at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida and back at Mission Control in Houston at the Johnson Space Center, hoping there's no problems. We really want to go that day. The countdown is going, and eventually it gets to where they're polling people for launch. Hopefully everybody says yes, everything's go, the weather cooperates. And then counting down to the liftoff at 41 seconds to go, it goes on an automatic sequencing. Um, a few seconds before the actual zero time, the main engines light first, and if the computer senses they are good, we get a, uh, the, the solid rocket motors light, and we lift off the launch pad. So 
This thing was probably two and a half million moving parts and about, I don't know, 230 or 40 miles of wiring. You know, and there's other gee whiz factors, I could, numbers I could throw out there, but you kind of get the picture. There's a lot going on and we lift off. And the combined fuel that's being consumed is probably about 25,000 pounds per second. So after 90 seconds, the whole thing weighs half of what it did at liftoff. So what does that mean? We're going faster and faster. And there's acceleration. Never more than three times the force of gravity, three times the force of gravity this way. And we actually throttle back the main engines not to exceed that, not for the humans, but for the shuttle with its wings and tail section and all of those things. So after a very exciting ride, we arrive in orbit. We have uh, a chance to turn our vehicle into a home for a few days. I mentioned briefly I mean, many, many of the things that go on up there, but let me just say it, it is a place that we can live, we can work. We have to put, this is me looking a bit younger several years ago, putting some suits away. We have to put away our gear. We live in the mid-deck, one of the pictures on the top there that is below the main area where the crew sits, where most of the crew sits for launch and landing. So it becomes our home. And it's a, it's a place to look at the Earth and have a perspective and to learn how to live up there. And eventually, um, I don't have a lot of time to talk today, so I'm skipping a landing already, but I'll tell you some more other things in a minute. We have to turn that home that started out as a rocket, became our home and play in space, and now it has to come home and land like a glider. And that was an interesting challenge to take that speed, that orbital speed of about 17,500 miles per second and somehow bleed that energy off to come home, which we do only by slowing down just enough that we dip back into the Earth's atmosphere as we come down and we just use friction with that energy management all the way to the ground to the landing site and a touchdown. And we did that in the shuttle program um, with all the missions, not always here in Florida, sometimes in California. So it was quite a program. Uh, we had 135 flights, the last one was in July of last year. But what we still have in orbit is the International Space Station, a continuation of these international endeavors that I think may in many ways be one of the, the greatest legacy of the station. Uh, we've continuously had people there since 2000. We constructed it between the years of about 1998 through 2001, including the last, some of the last logistics that went up. And so, um, we, we built it up there. It took about 45 flights, most of those about 37 by the space shuttle. A tremendous engineering effort because it was built in different parts of the world, a lot of it here, but not all of it. Um, most of it could not have been tested on the ground prior to being assembled in orbit. Um, so just really an incredible scientific project, engineering project that was done now today, and we hope to continue it at least to 2020 and hopefully beyond. If, as long as it stays working well enough. And today we can visit it with the vehicles that you see that are kind of in yellow. Uh, the Russian Soyuz is the way that we have to get people up and down. We also use the Russian Progress vehicle to take cargo, which could be food, supply, science, anything up and down. The European Automated Transfer Vehicle can do that, and the Japanese H2 Transfer Vehicle. Now what you see missing there is United States or NASA, and of course up until last year we had the shuttle, um, which gave us the capability we've kind of lost now to bring very much back. But where we hope to be too shortly is that to at least return from our country with cargo, with more private companies, which I might say commercial companies, but rather than being a direct contract with NASA, they're, they're more privatized and we contract with them for individual flights for cargo, they're working on that, and we have new NASA hardware and work as well that could eventually take people back to the space station. And perhaps these commercial enterprises may also send people, but for us to launch people again from here, there's gonna be a several year gap before we're able to do that again. But fortunately, we do have other countries that, that can help us do that now. And you can see how international this is from the western coast to the United States across the world eastward to Japan. We have even now centers that are involved with the day-to-day -day operations of the space station. So here I'm going to try to give you, uh, after we look at this, uh, here's how it looks today, all put together. Um, very modular solar arrays. We now can have a crew of six people all the time, and it's not really limited by the space inside as much as by the electrical power, the amount of water, the air that people have to breathe. So all these things that 
we have to either take up there, or the only thing we can really create there is the electricity, <clears throat> of course, through the energy of the sun, but everything else we have to bring from Earth. So right now we have a crew of six, could potentially someday be a crew of seven, but mostly six people, of which uh, we have an average of two of those seats at any one time. So I'm gonna try to give you a feel here for how, we, how this was constructed in orbit. Uh, like I said, 45 flights, there was the, the initial one was a Russian launch there. Um, it's kind of hard for me to catch all these people that are going to get all these things that are going together, but there are different modules. We, we, we changed the plan and took up those solar arrays you see there early and mounted them in the center. They'll later get moved, as you'll see if you watch, so we could get people up there earlier. There's a robotic arm that was added. Um, here's some more of the truss section going up. We've already seen the airlock go up. The arm was moved there in a mobile carrier. Uh, more truss, because they're trying to get built out to get the solar panels. And these things that are being built to the side also contain sometimes platforms that we can mount external experiment packages on. So all of this was put together, though, with many people uh, going out to do spacewalks, actually over 1,000 hours of spacewalking time with a lot of robotic arm operations as well. So you see that center array just collapsed because they're gonna, it's going to be moved out to an outer segment. Again, that was a robotic operation. But we also had to send people out every time this was done to reconnect cables and other hookups. So this just represents a tremendous amount of work. Um, we've now had people, <coughs> excuse me, living there, I think, for uh, 11 years, because I just checked, in about 164 days all the time, 24-7. As a matter of fact, here in Columbia, Missouri, we just had a great pass Wednesday night of the space station going overhead. It was very, very visible. One of the final things that was brought up was an alpha magnetic spectrometer, which is going to be residing on the station for several years to look at cosmic rays coming in from our universe and searching for things like dark matter. So we use the external part of the station as well as the inside. So all these pieces, you know, and some of those external platforms have um, spare parts. So there's a certain strategy in that as well. What do you expect to break? You know, what do you think you're going to need? And we tried to put as many things up there as possible. So there it is, the size of a football field in general, at least if you include the end zones and you know, that area around it. So it's huge. Uh, not that the people can live in all of it, but it has actually a very, very large living space inside. So again, today I'm focusing more on how do we live and work there, and my last flight, I was fortunate that we got to go visit there for a few days. I didn't stay for one of the long duration flights, I was there on the crew that we took up a new crew, and we brought the ones that had been up there back, and we did many other things while we were there as well, but here's a picture of all of us that were in space that night, or I use night relatively because <laughs> in low Earth orbit, we're, we're going around the world about every 90 minutes. So every time you go around, there's a sunrise and a sunset. So night and day has a whole different meaning. So, but you know, it's hard to lose, to quit using the terms that are familiar. But for an evening meal, I would say we were back in the Russian segment behind the table that they had back there to eat. So those are all the people that were in space that night. Uh, we didn't actually get to do that often during this mission that we were docked to the space station because it's a very, very busy time during that period of days. <coughs> But just like here on Earth, it's really important to have the social functions where you take time not to just to float by each other, you know, quickly on a mission to do something, but to take time and have a meal together and visit. And there was always a lot of interesting cultural exchange. I remember one of the things we had to eat that night, they had just had a progress supply ship visit, which had brought up some fresh food, and they had put a piece of dental floss strung across their cabin area down there and hung on wedges of onions on that. And so people were grabbing onions to eat. And it was just, you may not appreciate here, but I guess, you know, when you've had several months of food that is prepackaged to get something fresh and tart and very flavorful, you know, it was quite a treat. So just, you know, the little things. Now we have right now two American crew members on orbit, Dan Burbank and Don Pettit. And here's Dan. He's, uh, as well as being a Coast Guard pilot, um, he's also a musician. So there is a guitar up there, he can relax and unwind. And if you look around that area, you'll see there's just all sorts of things there. You know, there's cables and laptops. And this is just like turning your empty home, you know, into your empty house, I guess, into a real home, where you put out the things you need to live in it every day and to work. And that's how it looks around the whole station. 
but yet they have to take time out to relax, um, to enjoy holidays. Uh, they were up there for Christmas. The day-to-day -day things, this is Andre Kuypers. He's a European astronaut up there right now. Uh, short hair is better in space, but hey, even he had to cut his hair. And we have to do things like exercise because the muscles get a little lazy up there, so you have to keep working to keep that, to keep that in shape. So what is the perspective on our planet? Uh, this is a picture of me and my crewmate, um, Rich Clifford, on my last flight where we got to go do a spacewalk, kind of being in our own little space capsule in a way, and looking at the Earth. And both there, or perhaps in the cupola view on the space station where we see Andre again here, we get a great perspective on the world. We see deserts, we see the changing face of our planet with the sand dunes on the right changing. I think those are salt flats on the left. Even the sun glint on the waves and eddies in the ocean can show up to us from space. Sometimes we get a perspective, like here, looking across the Mediterranean, Africa on the right, some Spain on the left, and then seeing into the distance. Um, looking at the Earth's limb over the view of the space station itself. The, the prior ones were taken on my missions, but this is one that was taken on the space station. Sunrise, beyond what you're seeing there, is, are the lights of Ireland, the United Kingdom, as well as the aurora borealis. So it's pretty much, it's a very awesome view. So when are we going to launch people to space again? We have commercial endeavors that are going. I mentioned that we have the two companies right now that have seed money from NASA, SpaceX, and Orbital Sciences, and they plan to get, hopefully, some cargo launches, uh, some test flights at least, to go, get close to the space station this year in 2012. NASA is working on a new project to go beyond low Earth orbit. We've been giving our marching orders, or, or not we anymore because I'm here, but NASA has uh, perhaps for a destination, perhaps to an asteroid, maybe back to the moon or maybe a sweet spot behind it, which is Lagrangian point where gravity kind of balances out and we could put a crew there, poised behind the moon, perhaps to do robotic operations on the surface. And maybe in the lifetimes of when I talk to really young people, I say perhaps in your lifetime we'll go to Mars. So that, that's a, just a quick view of, of the future launch system that we're working on now. Um, and why do we go? I think we go because, I mean, I, I went because I wanted to. I was proud to be a part of the space program, but no one, um, you know, made me do it. I really wanted to do it. And I was fortunate that I was able to do that. I'd love to see everyone be able to go. This country can afford to dream. Not everyone in the world can right now, but we can here, and I think that's one of the reasons we do it. You may not think about it every day, but if we didn't have it and we were relegated to the sidelines, would we not feel in some way diminished because we can't do it anymore? Um, and there are benefits to it. That could be a whole talk in itself. I don't think they have all been realized, and by the way, Tang and Velcro are not spinoffs of our space program, but there are many things that are. <laughs> um, so it's a test bed. We will do more things. I don't think we know what all of those are yet. And it's politics. We never had any space program from Mercury through the space station that was driven by science. It's always driven by politics. But because that occurs, we can use that to our advantage to do all of these other things. And I think we do it because it is there, and that's what humanity is. We are a curious species. We wonder what's going on. We want to figure it out. And our two astronauts up there are bloggers on some of these things, fragileoasis.org. And I love one of Don's posts that he put up earlier this year where he's a really interesting thinker, a very out-of-the-box guy. And he says, you know, this is so interesting. We don't even, sometimes we don't even know what we need to ask. We don't even know the right questions much yet, much less know the answers yet. So there's a lot that's going to come, and I think we will realize in hindsight the benefits of this exploration. And one of our former administrators, Mike Griffin, talked about, I, I, like, I liked a lot of his comments, so that's why I put this quote in here. And he pointed out that what makes a country great? If you look back in history, it's been proven, for example, in the 17th century, um, Britain's mastery of the oceans and its navy, you know, put it at the forefront of the nations in the world. And we kind of experienced that ourselves with aviation in the 20th century and the beginnings of the space exploration. And so I think... That's going to be it in the future. It's not the only new frontier. I mean, we have the depths of the ocean. We have Antarctica. But I think the one that's the world stage, the players on the world stage, it is space exploration and with people. So the other countries are going to do it, um, whether we do in this country or not. 
So I'm going to leave you. I've got to get off the stage uh, here. But uh, this is a video that's been on YouTube. Do I have to, no, here it starts. It should have been automatic. So you may have seen it. A lot of people have. This is sped up tremendously, maybe 100 times, because it takes the shuttle about 10 minutes or the space station to go across the United States. But here's a collection of nighttime views um, where you can see where the people are when the lights come out. And I loved that about being in space. We, got, we could take our favorite music, and we had time look out. I don't think I ever had a more contemplative time in my life than listening to music and looking at the Earth go by. So here's some of those views from the space station, um, just the clouds, the storms, the city lights. And I'm leaving you with this just because if I, were, if I could take you there and show you what's one of the best memories, I think this would be it. And um, you know, what I remember is when it, the sun would go down as it did every orbit, and we had time to look out. You couldn't see where the people were until then. And then the lights would come out, and almost everywhere in the world. And here we are, I think, by the way, coming down on Italy. On the right, you can kind of see the boot there, and we're heading south across our planet. It's just a marvelous, marvelous view. Um, and again, I think we do this uh, not just to have that view, but because it's exploration. It's where we haven't been before, and I'm excited that we're looking at going beyond low Earth orbit. And I hope that there are ways that all of you can experience this someday. But thank you for giving me a chance to talk to you about it. Thank you.